as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I have a deep testimony of our restored doctrine. That is where my testimony lies. It doesn't rely with our leaders. Our leaders are a means for me to connect with God and the Savior, and our restored doctrine gives me the hope and the teachings and an ability to do that. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Saints Inscripted Podcast. Today we have a very amazing guest. I've uh, been so excited to have him on. When we finally booked him to come on, I got his book and I read it in like six or seven days. Way to go. (laughs) And it was just so, so amazing. But we've got Richard Osler here. He's an author of several books. One that we're holding right now is the Listen, Learn, and Love Embracing LGBTQ Latter-day Saints. Richard Osler also hosts the Listen, Learn, and Love podcast. I think you've got about like 315 and and counting episodes. You were just telling me about an episode you did, and I'm really excited to (laughs) listen to it. But uh, Richard Osler, especially with this book and um, kind of the focus of your podcast is just listen, learning, and loving LGBTQ Latter-day Saints, being an ally for... LGBTQ Latter-day Saints and, you know, throughout the years, obviously in this book that, you know, they haven't felt like they have a place in our church. They haven't felt maybe a place in society in general. True. So Richard, we've brought you on this season in the Saints and Scripted podcast is about faith crisis. We thought because you have written about your own faith crisis, you have talked with many people who have gone through faith crisis, who are going through faith crisis and in at a, and, and many different outcomes, right? People who have stayed in the church, people who have left the church, and, you know, many in between. And maybe while you're looking there, Jake, I'll just tell our, your listeners about my faith crisis. So I was serving as a YSA bishop from 2013 to 2016 in Salt Lake City. It's a three-year calling, and uh, my wife and I have six kids and and several grandkids, and I had never— in social media, I ended up connecting with a lot of people that were not active in our ward, and I listened to their stories, and I, re- I recognized there were people that considered the church their spiritual home but didn't participate for a number of reasons I didn't realize. And as I listened to them, it just the reasons people were having a difficult time with the church that I had concluded, like they sinned or Satan got a hold of them or they just didn't want to have faith, I recognized that for a majority— that was not true. They just had legit questions about the church. And I had legit questions about some of the issues they were raising. And I just, it all shifted for me because I recognized these were sincere people that asked honest questions. And I kind of grouped them into two areas historical past issues and current issues. And some had a little bit of both or one or the other. And, and so I. Uh, it led to a little bit of what I call a mini-faith crisis around the November policy statements in 2015. And I remember being uncomfortable about that, and I wrote about it in this in the book. And um, I went to my home stake president, Dave Sturt, um, a dear friend, and just opened up with him about being unsettled about this part of our church. And he, and I write about this in the book, he just let me have a, what I call a fallen domino or two. He gave me permission to be uncomfortable about something in the church. He didn't give me a spiritual checklist. He didn't doubt my sincerity. He didn't accuse me of being deceived by Satan or one of the elect that we deceived in the last days. And it was actually what I call a ministering home run. He just validated how I felt. And I ended up adopting a testimony in the church where I have a couple fallen dominoes but dominoes, you feel like if one foot domino falls, the inferences, they all fall. But for me, they didn't. And there's a lot of things that keep me a deeply believing member of the church, like heavenly parents, our doctrine about a heavenly father and a heavenly mother, and our eternal nature that love us, our increased understanding of the atonement of Jesus Christ, a plan of salvation, um, a loving God, um, the truth of the Book of Mormon, the added doctrine and teachings that are part of the Book of Mormon, and the priesthood that I feel I hold at a modern-day prophet. So, you know, Jake, I'm glad I went through that. It was emotionally hard for me. 
And maybe it was easier to do as the YSA bishop because I recognized some of the narrative didn't apply because I knew I was serving. I knew I wasn't, you know, I'm not perfect, but I knew that I was guilty of no great sin. And so I just, but I'm glad it happened because I just have more empathy for people. I can go there. It's not theoretical for me. It's real. And some of my sweetest moments are just sitting with people in their own faith crisis. And I've sat with some of the most faithful people I know in the middle of an LDS faith crisis. And they have some of the strongest relationships with Heavenly Parents and just some of the very best people. So if your listeners are in that space, they need to have a lot of love for themselves. And most I met with never intentionally said, oh, I'm going to go have a faith crisis because that'll allow me to leave the church and sin. Most people I meet with in a faith crisis actually want to stay in the church. They've given, they love the church, they've served, they've, you know, it's blessed them, but they, it's just, they're just aware of complex issues and they want to find a way to authentically stay. So they're some of the best. I liked what you put on Twitter, the, you know, if you're going through a faith crisis, what would you do? Would you stay in the church? Would you leave? And overwhelmingly, you know, True. people want to stay. And I feel like that's where I am because I've explained my faith crisis and just having a lot of a lot of painful things coming kind of to the forefront. I want to stay. Like if I were to answer your poll, I want to stay. Like I, I want to stay. I feel like, you know, there's great other places to go, other religions, other churches. But, you know, for me, I feel like my my the best place for me is this church and i want to do anything to make that happen uh, it's just it's so hard cuz there's so it's much incredibly uncertainty incredibly hard and so you you know my heart goes out to people like you and any of your listeners here because i don't think you said well i'm going to go have a faith crisis um, no. and it's it's em- usually emotionally very difficult it's e- an emotional experience to just feel this dissonance. It actually can affect people's health and they don't feel right and they don't feel the energy. And it's just, so it's a a faith crisis can be just completely consuming. And I just, and so you, I've learned every, you've got to validate how people feel, even if they don't feel that way. So my brother wrote a book called Bridges. If any of you, he's kind of the one of my favorite authors on this subject, and Patrick Mason. Um, so that would be a good book. I think you've been reading that book or aware of that book, Bridges, helping those with questions. Yeah. You know, there's kind of two audiences here. There's those in faith crisis that I that you know you and are in, and I have sort of found stability. I've been in a same spot for three or four years. And I think you just got to love yourself. You've got to continue to try to move forward. You've got to be willing to. I had to adopt a different model, um, a different framework for my belief in the church. It's the fallen domino model. You know that there's. I've got a bunch of standing dominoes, things I deeply believe that are my core reasons I stay in the church. But I have fallen dominoes, and I don't focus on the fallen dominoes. I don't sort of say, "Well, I've got to reconcile. I've got to solve this," because I. I've, and I'm just at peace. Polygamy is one. I'm just not, I don't have a testimony of polygamy, Jake. I don't know if it's required to be an active Latter-day Saint. It's not a temple recommend question. I don't go out and evangelize people to that believe in polygamy, um, that I don't, and you should feel like m- me. But I think one heart and one mind in Moses just means we all are trying our best to come unto Christ. It doesn't mean we have uniform beliefs about everything in our church. So let's create space for people that believe in polygamy, don't believe in polygamy, that believe in the November policy, that don't, that are uncomfortable about our history with blacks, that are. Um, Let's don't judge people that feel like our church leaders made mistakes around certain issues as they continue to stay in the church and sustain our leaders. And let's don't criticize people that hope something might change in our church as they continue to obey those teachings. I use a simple example in the book about what about all those that actually hope one day we quit drinking. They'd like to drink tea and coffee. Um, They actually hope that the Word of Wisdom allows just people to make their own choice on that. It's not a temple recommend question. But today they continue not to drink tea and coffee. Should we exclude them from the church or the temple because they have a hope something changes? So I think we just... 
you know, we're uncomfortable sometimes with people that hold different views or have different hopes or different feelings about our past. And I think if they open up, then I think that's back to what do we do, those of us that aren't in a faith crisis, and I'm in both worlds now because I have known that world and helped people in that world. I think we just are too, we need to honor how they feel and validate how they feel and ask follow-up questions and sit with them in their questions and not be triggered if they hold beliefs that are different than ours. Because I think, I don't think the goal is to have everybody have the same uniform beliefs in our church about everything. So, you know, we just, and we can't point to Satan and say, well, Satan's deceived you. That keeps everything in a nice tidy box for me, but it doesn't, it doesn't give me the tools to sort of sit with you and, and listen to your challenges. But what an interesting perspective that you can have hope for change. You know, like, I mean, I'm sure many, 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 you know, black members of the church before 1978 who were faithful hoped for a change. Yeah. You know, and who knows? Like, there's so many issues. Gay people hope for a change, right? And you hear stories, you hear, you develop empathy. So that's really the focus of the book is develop empathy so we can better minister and embrace. And the book, as you've read, Jake, is not too much about me because I don't, I want to kind of be a, a platform to bring voice to other groups of people that have less voice. So I have all the privilege in the church that you can have. I'm, I, you know, <laughs> oh, I don't go through all the things, um, age, church experience, you know, th- just all those things. And so I feel like my job is, is a committed Latter-day Saint is, is to sort of bring voice to other groups of people, which is what you're doing in this ministry here at More Good in this podcast is trying to, you know, help us understand how women feel, how blacks feel, how undocumented workers, in particular, we're talking about LGBTQ people in faith crisis. And I've learned you know, Fiona Given says to touch someone's cross, I mean, to really bear someone's burden, you got to touch their cross. And there's visual imagery in that. And so, yeah, I think LGBTQ people ultimately need to feel that how they're created is not a mistake, that, that it puts them on the same moral footing as straight people. And it doesn't take agency off the table, it doesn't change our doctrine. It just, no one should look in the mirror and think they're a mistake. And no one should feel like God. LGBTQ people generally do better when they can accept this part about them because then – and often it becomes because other people accept this part about them, friends, family, and they love them knowing that they're gay or lesbian or trans. And then they start to think, well, maybe God loves me too and maybe I can love myself. And everybody just does better when they feel that they're worthy of God's love and and especially that God – in this beautiful diversity world created everybody the way they're supposed to be. Only Christ is perfect. It's not saying everybody's perfect, but pointing to the fall of Adam and somehow saying that applies more to LGBTQ people isn't fair. Talking about the natural man and saying that applies to gay people more than straight people isn't fair. Everything that I read about putting off the natural man are things in my control. Pride, you know, the list, but being for a gay person, they can't, that's becoming ungay. Their orientation is something that's not within their control. The church doesn't, you know, church doesn't say, go pray this away anymore or use the power of the atonement to become straight. The atonement can heal a a broken heart. And a lot of our LGBTQ members have broken hearts, but, you know, it doesn't change sexual orientation. The church is pretty clear on that. So, you just develop more empathy as you sit with people that, you know, aren't in your normal circle, and that's blessed my life. I I kind of thought I was supposed to help LGBTQ people and sort of be their good Samaritan, but in many ways, they have helped me to be a better disciple and have taught me about Christ and empathy and compassion and understanding of others, and I'm a better person with the LGBTQ people in my life, and I I mourn when they leave because we're worse off. And you know that. Um, They're some of the very best people I know. And when they go to one of the chapters in here is chapter seven, it's sort of ministering to LGBTQ Latter-day Saints. And and some would 
in later chapters, could our doctrine change? And I sort of, I don't really answer that question because I don't know God's will, and I'm not a leader in our church. Um, but chapter 7 is just, what do we do to create an inclusive culture? And it, the bar is pretty low. I mean, there's a missionary in his mission that talks about the mission president was saying, what do we need to improve the mission culture? And he says, well, president, let's stop the gay jokes. And if we're really Christ's disciples, should we be having gay jokes part of our culture? And, you know, they all repented during that leadership conference as missionaries. And so there's just, if you're gay and you just go to church and hear unkind things about people like you, most of your LDS experience, you're just going to f- create a feeling that people like me aren't welcome, even if you're living all the church teachings. So we just need to uh, the biggest thing that shifted for me, Jake, is just I used to always think of LGBTQ people as a different group of people on a different road that posed a universal threat to me and my family. And being a YSA bishop to a couple gay men, I just it all shifted because I had priesthood responsibility and listened to these guys and just heard their hearts and sat with them in their stories, and it all shifted for me. And I thought, holy cow. These are our own people, our own family, our own ward members. This isn't another group. These people are in our congregations, and we need to look at them that way and and not sort of just and, and say kind things assuming there's LGBTQ people. Well, thanks, Richard. I think that's so good to hear. What have you learned that helps people to stay? And maybe our, our audience right now watching can can take from that. Good question. I think the thing, um, it's sort of a deconstruction, reconstruction. So that's a term people in faith crisis use. We have to deconstruct um, what they deconstruct, you know, things that they no longer feel good about and reconstruct. So I went through a deconstruction, which represents my fallen dominoes. And my reconstruction was just confirming belief in existing dominoes. And that became my new sort of foundation moving forward. Now, some people deconstruct all the way to, do I believe in God or not? And and so I I never lost my belief in God. I never doubted his existence. And and so I didn't have a major deconstruction. But that's the process people need to go through. Um, And I think it's okay to give people permission to go through that and just find out Um, Jared Halverson, if you want to listen to one of my podcasts, is a Salt Lake City Institute teacher. You could Google Jared Halverson, Richard Osler on my channel or just on the internet and get to it. He just talks about deconstruction, reconstruction, and sort of giving permission for people that need to do that to do that. But then reconstruction is just sort of, okay, this is what I believe in, how I'm moving forward. And that's been a you know, that's helped me. And I just, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I have a deep testimony of our restored doctrine. That is where my testimony lies. It doesn't rely with our leaders. Our leaders are a means for me to connect with God and the Savior. And our restored doctrine gives me the hope and the teachings and an ability to do that. I support and sustain our leaders. I have heroes in those leaders. But those leaders aren't perfect. They aren't perfect now, and they haven't been perfect in the past. And if your testimony is only based on the leaders, that's going you're going to get let down at times. You've got to develop a testimony on a restored doctrine. That is what makes us unique from every other Christian church. If you really look at our uniqueness of our restored doctrine and how that applies to us in our lives, that to me is the beauty of our restored church. And I believe that came through Joseph Smith. And and he brought forth more scripture to help us come into Christ. But the church is a means to come into Christ. The goal, I sort of look on if we're like on the ocean, the current is the church that gets us to safety, which is an island. The island represents our relationship with Heavenly Father and the Savior. But the church is current, and sometimes that current moves you towards the island, but sometimes our church is not perfect, and its people aren't perfect, the culture and it can cause the current to move in the wrong direction. And you, if people are having a negative experience at church, that's possible. It's called church-generated pain. And we need to honor that and recognize sometimes we say the church is perfect and the people aren't. But I, to me, the gospel of Jesus Christ is perfect. Our church has been restored and has the priesthood and the priesthood keys. 
and I'm a temple worker. I honor and support our church and our, and do the best to obey my covenants, but our church isn't perfect. President Nelson's really good about saying the restoration is an ongoing process. So if people are uncomfortable about something, I think we need to say that's okay to be uncomfortable. If they feel pain from a church leader or a church saying or something in the church, and an LGBTQ bill, to answer some of your question about do they have faith crisis, sometimes they do. If you're gay, it's, you're in a double bind. A lot of the gay men I meet with have a testimony both they about this is who I am and I would like to spend my life with somebody, please, versus be alone for seven decades, and they love the church. So they're in a double bind where they don't want to give up either part of them. And so you just have to empathize with their road. And I invite everybody that I meet, LGBTQ or straight, to stay in the church. But for LGBTQ people in particular, I think they need to self-determine with God the best path for them. And then our job is just to honor that. That's part of the mortal experience and mortal agency that we honor. So that so when someone steps away from the church, I don't have as much fear as I used to because I really own the doctrine of heavenly parents that love us and want to do everything we can, they can to get us back. So I don't conclude anybody's eternal standing based on where they are right now on earth life. <laughs> it's not my job. I don't have those kind of eyes to do that. And that's relieving to me. And so I just, and I think it's a false dichotomy that to fully love and follow God, we need to stop loving some of his children. We just, the doctrine to me is love everybody and leave judging to Heavenly Father, well, doctrinally Christ, who will be our ultimate judge, and just love everybody. So if you're in a faith crisis, I feel you. You may look back on this and look at this as a positive experience. To me, I call it falling forward. I looked at this, Jacob, as a step back in my journey as a Latter-day Saint that I went through a faith crisis when I was going through it. I thought, well, this is bad. And there's shame around that. I wouldn't, I didn't want to tell anybody um, because I thought people will point to me as the guy that's, okay, just he's the guy now. And now I I look at it as po- as a positive part of my mortal life, and I wouldn't take it back. It's made me rely more on Heavenly Father and the Savior. It's increased my relationship with them. I realized our church couldn't answer every question for me. I love our church. I support and sustain our church. Um, but it caused me to, re- which is the doctrine of our church, is to rely on the church on God. And it gave me empathy for other people. I, I call myself the wounded healer, which is a term I, I feel wounded by that whole experience, but I can, because I know the desert of a faith crisis, I can authentically lead people out of that desert if possible. Hey, sorry, our camera overheated on Richard. And so we stopped and kind of uh, rearranged some things. But thank you, Richard. I feel tremendously grateful that you were able to come here today because as this journey kind of goes through with this faith crisis and the episodes we're making and so I feel extremely privileged to be in this spot to especially meet you today and I was thinking as you were talking the the words that you said I have a strong testimony in the restored gospel right the restored doctrine and priesthood and all the stuff that comes along with the restored gospel but I, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a testimony or belief that the leaders are perfect or, <laughs> or anything. We can say that we have those strong dominoes, at least I can say. And if those of you that are struggling with that, um, hopefully this can help too. But it helps with that domino effect, right? I have these dominoes, right? Book of Mormon, I'd say, is a strong domino. You know, the restored church, I believe this church was restored. And the Book of Mormon's almost kind of a catalyst to that. If you believe the Book of Mormon, you believe a lot of the things in the restoration. But to allow some of those dominoes to fall and church leaders, church members, the church in general, how you know, its administrative qualities and a lot of stuff. So anyway, thank you. And uh, we hope some of this helped you guys. We're, we're so grateful for Richard and all of the work he's done. He's such a great friend and such a great ally to anyone that meets him. Uh, we had a, a really cool conversation before starting, and he, he's just such a great person. And I would I would so invite you to to read his book, to read everything that has the 
the name Richard Osler on it or listen to it because everything he, he produces is so faith affirming and so, so amazing for those to hear who are struggling and who maybe some of those that aren't struggling. Because I don't really know you, Richard, other than from a perspective of someone struggling. That's <laughs> and so even when maybe someday when hopefully some of this can get um, resolved and reconciled, hopefully I can still learn so much from you. Obviously I will. Um, but it'll just be interesting from not just such a vulnerable state that I feel like I'm in. You're a good man, Jacob, and you you have helped a lot of people and you will continue to help a lot of people. And I think you'll look back at this really difficult chapter, even though you'd love just to press a button and have it be over or never happen big time. But I think you'll look back and say, I'm glad this happened. I'm in a better spot and I'm able to help more people. So I don't, Sometimes I think if Heavenly Father could come on these podcasts, he might sit here and say, this is what I always knew would happen with you. I knew you well enough. I knew your mind and your heart and how you like to understand. He might just say, this is, I knew this would be part of your journey. And I am walking with you. You're going to be okay. And you'll actually be able to do more of your life mission because of this experience in your life. And so I, I believe that for a lot of people I meet with. So that's, and maybe that helps us all have more self-compassion for ourselves when we feel like well, this, isn't, this isn't like a backtrack for me or even though it's painful. We grow in pain. Again, thank you. And I respect you so much for doing all you do. And you've helped me tremendously. And, and I hope this has helped you guys out there. There's a lot of hope and there's a lot of, things that Richard said today that I believe can help and has helped me. So please don't forget to read his book, to listen to his podcast, Listen, Learn, and Love. You have stuff that comes out in the Enzyme every once in a while, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. And go watch his Saints Unscripted episode. You were on one, right? Yeah. Yeah, talking about LGBTQ. Exactly. <laughs> Just love hearing you talk about it, and it's so inspiring for those of us that you know may not – have ha you know known a lot of people in that in that sphere and um it helps a lot of us start to understand and want to have the conversations with you know family friends like i feel like this whole week that's all i've talked about with family and friends oh i read this and listen learn and love <laughs> it's just so fantastic so please uh check those out and thank you for watching subscribe to saints unscripted like this video and we'll see you next time <laughs>